I'm Hashem Sarkis, Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning, and I am very honored to introduce to you Mary Robinson, who will speak about recognizing human rights as a critical dimension of the international fight against climate change. The work we do here at MIT and the School of Architecture and Planning around climate change often recognizes this connection, Mary. So we thank you for bringing the school and MIT and the world together around this urgent topic and for helping us sharpen our inquiries, principles, and most importantly, our actions. I would also like to thank the incredible organization, Mothers Out Front, fighting against climate change, and its director, Kelsey Worth, for co-sponsoring Mary's visit to Boston. I first met Mary and her husband, Nicholas, in June 2017 on one of the hottest nights on record in London. It was a few days after the tragic Grenfell Tower fires. We were all guests in the beautiful garden of our mutual and dear friend, Hadil Ibrahim. As I was awkwardly trying to conceal my discomfort during that midsummer encounter with global warming, Mary was there vigorously discussing the future of cities as the havens of equity, the role of art in straddling societal divides, the difference between the size of mosquitoes of an English garden and an Irish garden. There are no mosquitoes in an Irish garden, right? <laughs> and her aspirations for her grandchildren that she had just babysat. In the heat of that night, she was already decades ahead of all of us, anticipating and taking on the injustices of a warmer future. That night, I realized what everybody who knows Mary Robinson had already told me. She is at once of this world and not of this world. Her feet in the dirt of refugee roads and the dust of droughts, and her head in the cosmopolitics that will bring an end to both. She is at once an engaged citizen and a public intellectual, committed to humanity without abandoning her own. Let me add a bit of biography to illustrate this incredible duality. Mary Robinson is the former president of Ireland and United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, and is now Chair of the Elders and a member of the Club of Madrid. She served in two capacities as the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy on Climate Change. In 2009, she was awarded the US Presidential Medal of Freedom. She is President currently of the Mary Robinson Foundation, Climate Justice, which serves as a center for thought leadership, education, and advocacy for poor, marginalized populations who are the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Her recently released book is entitled Climate Justice, Hope, Resilience, and the Fight for a Sustainable Future. I would also recommend her podcast, Mothers of Invention. So this is Mary Robinson, and this is Mary Robinson every day, and today, she will speak to us about the need to galvanize political will globally and to commit to transformative change that leaves no one behind. So please join me in welcoming to MIT the special envoy to the future of humanity, Mary Robinson. Thank you, Hashim, for that very warm introduction and happy May Day, everybody. First of May. Uh, it really is an honor to be invited to speak at MIT. And you know, to be perfectly honest, to tell you the truth, I think I almost invited myself because I wanted to have the opportunity, since I was going to be in Boston, of catching up with Dean um, Hashim Sarkis again. Uh, but MIT is a great place to try out an idea. And I've been doing some thinking recently, and I wanted to test it uh, with this audience and then hopefully uh, discuss it in a a Q&A um, for uh, the second half of our involvement. Um, I know that MIT had an involvement in the recent stunning first photograph of a black hole in space. And I want to reference another hole, the concern some years ago about the widening hole, hole in the ozone layer. And how was it that the world managed to come together so quickly and to adopt in August 1987, the Montreal Protoc Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer. That was a, uh, a binding international treaty 
phasing out the production of numerous substances that were responsible for ozone depletion. And it was signed by 187 countries. It was the first treaty in the history of the UN to receive universal ratification. So, you know, my question is, why haven't we been able to act as effectively in tackling the existential threat of climate change? And how do we get the political will and the sense of global solidarity that we need? Um, I believe that it's through what I see now as an emerging movement for climate justice, putting pressure on governments and on business, particularly the fossil fuel industry. It's very heartening to see women leaders coming together for the first time on climate change. It's only very recent, but it's happening. Um, I was with a group of women leaders in Bellagio in Italy last week. Um, women in Africa are joining together and it's high on their agenda. Women in Asia are joining together and it's high on their agenda. It's not yet high enough on the agenda here in the United States or in Europe, but it's beginning to be. And even the, the Mothers Out Front yesterday was a good example of how it is emerging and what they're doing around this country. Um, children have started to strike um, on Fridays and uh, go out of school under the leadership of Greta Thunberg. Uh, the 12th of May will be their next uh, big day, and it's also International Mother's Day, and the mothers are combining, the parents are combining with their, with their children. And we've had Extinction Rebellion. You probably saw the disruption in London. As a result, uh, Jeremy Corbyn this morning was calling for a climate emergency, and that the United Kingdom would put a stake in the ground and say that the United Kingdom would be net zero greenhouse carbon emissions uh, by 2050. At the moment, it's committed to 80% reduction. Um, so there's something happening. There's a, there's a kind of movement happening. And uh, I think the importance of this movement is that it's going to be very necessary. Um, let me go back to 2015. Um, I had my mandate as the special envoy of the Sec UN Secretary General on climate change. So I was following observing, if you like, and following closely uh, the negotiations for two big frameworks. The first were the messy negotiations for the 2030 agenda with its 17 sustainable uh, development goals. And uh, I actually uh, am wearing a borrowed um, badge um, of an Irish former PhD student whom I gave a degree to who happened to be in the room and gave me her badge which she was wearing because I was sorry I had my own badge. This is the only badge of the UN I've ever liked, so I like to wear it. Um, and um, when the countries, the 193 countries, uh, were negotiating and came together in September uh, nine, um, 2015, it was clear to them that, that the 2030 agenda was voluntary. But it was also very interesting to see the language that was used in framing it a language of human rights, gender equality, solidarity, leave no one behind, prioritize the furthest behind first. Maybe because it was voluntary, they agreed with more heart or something. But anyway, we have the 2030 agenda and governments are voluntarily reporting on it to the high level political forum every July. And I've been witnessing um, and my foundation was getting them to particularly highlight gender and human rights in their reporting. And then we had the Paris Climate Agreement, and that was the one I had a particular focus on as Special Envoy of the Secretary General. And I attended so many formal ministerial meetings, but also informal ministerial meetings in the run-up to Paris. And they were incredibly boring because everyone said the same thing. You knew what China was going to say, you knew what the United States was going to say, you knew what Russia was going to say, you knew what India was going to say, you knew what Brazil was going to say, you knew what the European Union was going to say, everybody repeating their lines. And I have to say, there was a very big and significant coming together of China and the United States, pushing each other, and that was very significant. But in those meetings, you also had other voices, in particular the voice of Tony de Brum of the Marshall Islands. And he kept repeating the same thing, and I heard him over and over again. Do you really want my country to go under? Do you want us to no longer be a sovereign people? Do you realize that if we go above 1.5 degrees, we will no longer exist? Do you care about my people? Over and over again. And I think, and I know, that that was why we got that goal in the uh, Paris Agreement 
of staying well below 2 degrees and working for 1.5 degrees. And because scientists hadn't looked at that, the Paris Agreement, as you probably know, asked the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to do a report on 1.5 degrees warming and to explain to us what's the difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. And if we need to stay at 1.5 degrees, what, what, would, what do we need to do, basically? And uh, I'm going to simplify, but what the report explained is that there is a very big difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. That's when about 80% or perhaps more of the coral reefs disappear. That's when a lot of the Arctic ice disappears. That's when permafrost begins to seriously melt. And then you have potential blowback that scientists are very uh, concerned about, rightly. And so the scientists concluded that the whole world needs to stay at the level where we can have a, a reasonably safe world for the future, and that is at 1.5 degrees. That going anywhere above that becomes more and more dangerous, and two degrees is dangerous. Two degrees. As you probably know, we're on course at the moment for more than three degrees. Um, and the scientists told us that it's doable to get on course for a zero carbon world by 2050, which is the only way to stay at 1.5 degrees, but that what we need to do is to reduce carbon emissions by 45%. They said in the next 12 years, because they were talking last October, it's now the next 11 years and we're on the 1st of May. So it's, you know, that's the fifth month of the year. Time is very short. And last year, as you probably, I'm sure you know, carbon emissions went up. So we are in a very strange dilemma. We're faced with an existential threat. We have um, advice from the scientists that we have... 11 years now in which to radically change course, and it's doable if we have the political will. So the real question is, how do we get that political will? And that's where I'm so excited about what is actually happening, the bits that are coming together. It's not just women leaders and the children and young people and Extinction Rebellion, etc. It's also business. Um, as an elder, and I'm now, as you heard, chair of the elders that Nelson Mandela brought together some time ago, um, I'm also an honorary member of the B team of business leaders. And the B team distinguished itself in January 2015 by making a commitment as a group of corporations that they would be net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 in their corporations and in their supply chain. And that was real leadership at the time. Christiana Figueres was very pleased about it. And they've been keeping it up by co-chair the net zero task force of the B team in order to keep them to account. I mean, I, I'm their conscience, if you like. And uh, there's no doubt they are making serious commitments and uh, are willing to be um, uh, accountable. So they've also influenced the broader We Mean business, which is about 400 or so companies that have been following the climate discussions and wanting more ambition and more regulation, um, putting a price on carbon, removing fossil fuel subsidies, etc., by governments. They've been pressing for that. And now the We Mean Business as a whole has committed, not every business has probably got there yet, to be net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and kind of work backwards. And we're hearing a lot of that language now. Um, how do we get to um, uh, the um, idea of the um, uh, commitment to be um, zero carbon emissions? But we need a global framework that actually will bring us there. And what I've been thinking about is, so in 2015, the delegates who negotiated in the UN negotiated what they called a voluntary agreement, and then negotiated later a Paris treaty, which has a few bits that are treaty, a few shalls, but they weakened it. And um, it's basically almost vo entirely uh, voluntary. Uh, but reality has kicked in. And what reality is saying is, this isn't voluntary anymore. This is imperative. Because we have to do everything that was committed to, but with the voluntary in the back of their mind, that countries could kind of choose how they would do it. 
Um, that's no longer the case. If we're going to have a safe future for our children and grandchildren, and indeed, you know, for those of you who are um, looking quite young to me, everybody looks young to me actually, but you know, um, it's, it's your future too. Um, uh, then it is imperative that we fully implement what was committed in the 2030 agenda in those 17 sustainable development goals, that we leave no one behind, and also that we commit to the Paris Climate Agreement and become much more ambitious in 2020, when the next um, assessment is of the nationally determined contributions. And um, the leaving no one behind um, is in itself a, an important one because it particularly speaks to the billion people, at least out of our world of what is it, 7.6 billion approximately, who never switched the switch for electricity. Many of them in Africa, good number in India. Um, there are entrepreneurs and there are um, uh, local communities trying to reach them, but they're not doing it with that kind of moonshot approach that we should be doing. Um, uh, you remember John F. Kennedy um, committing to uh, putting a man on the moon in eight years, and it was impossible when he said it, um, but uh, it was done, and I think the, <clears throat> the average age in NASA, I gather, when it was done, <clears throat> was 26. So that's in itself um, quite interesting. And not only do we have a billion people who never switch the switch for electricity, but we have clean lights, um, solar panels, units, etc. We could, we could reach them if we set it as a moonshot endeavor. We also have 2.3 uh, billion people who cook still on uh, dirty charcoal, um, animal dung, wood, and inhale and die from um, um, indoor air pollution. So that too is part of the um, leave no one behind. And it would be the most incredible way to address uh, poverty. If people have energy, they will take themselves out of the deep poverty. And they would, the children will be able to study. It, it, it just makes all the difference. It'll cut down maternal um, mortality. Um, it's, um, it's a life changer. In fact, I'm old enough to remember my father, who was a medical doctor in the west of Ireland, talking about um, when, Ar when Ireland got rural electrification. And as a doctor, what that meant. It was a few years before I was born. And he was still kind of excited about it, because it had made such a difference to his work as a doctor. And uh, you know, it, it's a pretty shocking in the 21st century that we still have these very significant proportions of the world who are in the dark as far as energy is concerned, but who now could leapfrog into clean energy. And that's the point. It's the exciting moonshot sense of what we can do that I wanted to get across. So rising to the challenge of addressing the threat of climate change, I think, can be truly transformative, because we can't do it without that solidarity and relationships. We have to, instead of being more and more populist and competitive and nationalistic, we actually have to do the opposite and go back to that framework of the 2030 agenda about leaving no one behind, prioritizing the, the furthest behind first. And so let me conclude, because I really want to hear your views on all of this, um, by giving you the three things that I say to any captive audience that I address now. And you're pretty captive. You can't escape. I'm going to um, hit you with my, my three um, uh, things that I feel that we all need to do now. And the first of them is everyone needs to make climate change personal in their lives. Meaning you've got to do something that you weren't doing before because you recognize the importance of climate change. Um, I give the example that I'm, I've become a pescatarian. I no longer eat meat. You know, I love lamb from the west of Ireland, but I've given it up and I don't cheat, nor am I going further as others are doing, like vegetarian, vegan, etc. You know, at my age, Pescatarian is enough, I'll, I'll stop there. But it costs me, so I've done my bit, I've done something. And then when you've done that, that's the first thing, then get angry with those who have more power and more responsibility and should be doing far more. Governments at every level, including the city level, uh, business, particularly fossil fuel, but all business, um, agriculture, transport. And then the third thing I think is possibly the most important because we don't talk about it enough, and this is exactly where I wanted to talk about this. We have to imagine this world 
that we want to get to as fast as possible. And that is what we're not hearing enough about. Uh, actually, people are worried about climate change, but even more worried that it's going to completely undermine their, their standard of living and their way of living, etc. And I think we're not thinking enough about what the uh, 2030 agenda told us about production and consumption. We cannot have a world where we're completely dependent on produ producing and consuming in order to um, fire our economies and grow. We've, we've got to have a different way. We've got to have a more sustainable, um, less use, less extraction. We've got to live more sustainably with Mother Earth and the eco ecosystems that sustain us and have a holistic approach uh, to uh, life in general and the ecosystems. Um, and uh, that means that we have to do some of the things that I grew up with, in fact, um, reusing, darning, um, uh, passing down clothes, but also uh, much more human relationships, um, uh, neighborhood relationships. And I had a chance to see, it was like a little light bulb going off, as I walked through the Venice Architectural Biennale last November. I was very proud to be there for a closing ceremony of the Biennale because it was being curated by two friends of mine from Ireland, two Irish architects who are also friends of Hashim's, um, Yvonne Farrell and Shelley uh, McNamara. And I, I was walking with a couple of other people, but I was kind of half with Shelley and half with Yvonne, and they were pointing out the various um, uh, um, um, ex ex exhibits, basically, um, um, projects. And you know, they were so relevant. Um, uh, they, you know, uh, forms of transport, forms of living together. And there was, a, there was a, um, one from Bangladesh, um, saris that had been thrown away that were now high fashion because they'd been you know, gathered in and, 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 and made into high fashion. Um, acupuncture architecture by a Chinese architect um, that stunned me because she worked in very rural villages in China. And I remember one of the projects, was, uh, the, the, the acupuncture was to go into a village and listen and see what would be one thing that could improve the lives of villagers. And the one that I particularly remember was there was a river um, in this village and the bridge had broken down. So it would be easy for architects to fix a bridge. But they listened and they discussed. And would it, be, would it make a difference if they actually had a covered part of that bridge where people could stop and have a market and shop and exchange? And that was what the acupuncture idea was, etc. And then the connection between those seven villages that she was working in. Um, we need to have a real sense of a future that actually is more human. It's a future where we have much more sense of solidarity and relationships. We've gone very far away from that. And I think it's the economic system that's driving it, the wealth inequality that's driving it, the, um, uh, as I say, the, the sense of um, uh, 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 fear and um, that's driving a populism. All of this is a, a kind of sign that we're not in a good place in our world. Um, very different from the mood of the negotiators in 2015. That's not so long ago. If we can take the existential threat of climate change seriously enough, it's the kind of um, driver of a new way of living which we've committed to. Governments of the whole world committed to the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Climate Agreement. Now we have to make it imperative that we actually take that completely seriously and over the next 11 years, get on course for a safe world and not have these school children saying, why should I go to school? I have no future. You're not protecting us. That's the challenge. And now I'd love to hear from you. Who'd like to start? And you can feel free to disagree, you know. Hi. Hello. Um, two points. My remembrance of the Montreal Protocol was that just before the meeting happened, DuPont announced that they had a substitute for for fluorocarbons, mm -hmm. and what happened was the, the uh, deniers were no longer funded. Mm -hmm. So 
so that's one reason, one difference. Mm -hmm. I would like to suggest something. Mm -hmm. I think that the Friday climate strikes for peace were true. Greta Thunberg actually got that idea from the Parkland, Florida students who had a, a strike against gun violence. Mm -hmm. right? So there's some circles here. Mm -hmm. I think the, the adults should help the children transform the Friday uh, strikes for climate into Friday teach-ins for climate. Mm -hmm. Right? which mm -hmm. would be especially interesting here in Boston. Mm -hmm. And then finally, into charrettes, hackathons for global solutions, so that from the bottom up, we produce change mm. that we can produce now. Mm -hmm. So those are my two comments, if you want to take them. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm hoping to get exactly those kind of deeper ideas and um, and and, uh, and and a deeper knowledge of the the Monte Montreal uh, Protocol. I mean, I, I've actually gone on uh, uh, gone publicly. I gave a, a lecture um, uh, in London recently where I actually described climate deniers as malign and even evil, because that's what I think now. Um, I think that climate denial is no longer something that we can sort of say, well, you know, they're entitled to their view. Uh, they're not entitled to their view. Those who um, are ignorant of climate issues don't know, OK, that's, a, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the climate deniers who are making short-term gains um, while they continue to contribute to what is destroying us. And that is evil. And I think it's about time you know, we strengthened our language. Um, I don't know whether that will... Um, uh, you know, have the effect of um, encouraging uh, a quicker move out of fossil fuel. But um, the fact that we increased our emissions last year is really frightening when we have to reduce by 45% over the next 11 years. And I love your idea of the Friday teach-ins. I think that's, um, uh, that's more productive in the sense it's also linking um, uh, parents and children and uh, uh, what, what the children have done, which I love, because I've been talking about climate justice for the last 15 years or so, is they've mainstreamed um, uh, the injustice of climate change. The injustice is intergenerational. It's unfair to them what their parents are failing to do. And that's, you know, many of you, and, and, and certainly me as a grandmother. Um, so I'm glad to see people piling up now, so let's talk. Okay? Um, which side? I'll go this side and then come back. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, connected to your point about getting angry at those who have more power and responsibility and seeing as we're here at MIT today, I'd be curious to know more about your thoughts of what the role of universities and institutions of higher education is in this and what obligations they have. That's again a, a, a very good question because I believe that universities have an enormous responsibility and many of them are taking it. I mean, I'm speaking in quite a lot of universities at the moment, and they are becoming more and more um, uh, leaders on sustainability in living, and the students are very engaged. I mean, I've just come from Chatham University in Pittsburgh, um, which Rachel Carson had um, been involved in and influenced, and they're very proud of their sustainability. I, I'm no doubt when I hear more about MIT, you're the same. I, I said last night that Harvard should divest um, from fossil fuel, and you know, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a graduate of Harvard, so I'm allowed to say it. I'm the class of 1968. Wow. Anyway, um, uh, um, you know, I, I think universities have a huge responsibility, but by and large, um, they're also becoming part of um, the positive change that I'm seeing, and you know, um, that has to be really encouraged, but they must divest. They must, they must have the integrity of what they're doing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Graham Sinclair. I'm at ESG Architect. I've been tweeting out um, some of what you said today. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, I've got two questions for you. Uh, one uh, leans back on your experience over many years as a politician, as, as a leader, and then your great work with the elders, um, which I held, uh, hold in high regard. And, and for me, that goes to, um, I'm a South African, so I've lived through that experience after apartheid. But being here in the US, I see, I have conversations that are very red state and blue state. Mm. And you know, I'm somewhere in between, I'm, I'm 
some other color. Um, what is your experience having lived through situations of these kind of entrenched ideas, people backed into their constituencies? Can you give us any hope, insight, wisdom on tackling those tough embedded situations? And then the second one, which I've seen evolving, I've been working in sustainable investment for two decades. And something that's come up working, you were yesterday with John Holdren, who's yeah. working with the, the Arctic Initiative. And something for us involved in the field for many years is actually something of a despair and something of a gloom. And I'm very clear we have to be optimistic and we have to keep mm. heading towards the top of the mountain. But it's also true that the more data you see, the more heavy this moment feels. So yeah. we can understand how you people call uh, you call people evil. You you just frank. Mm. But have you got any wisdom for those people <laughs> in the field? Many yeah. years batting, and going. The data keeps getting worse. Yeah. Can you help us see the yeah. hope? Okay. Well, there there are two um, big questions in a way. Um, uh, on the divide, and I, I, you know, I lived in this country for eight years, and I studied in this country um, when I was at the Harvard Law School, um, as, and I follow very closely. Um, you know, when I grew up in Mayo, the next parish was Boston. You know, so <laughs> it's very easy to follow what's going on in this country. And as you say, the divides have become uh, very sharp. But I'm actually also seeing now um, uh, discussion from a Republican side. We need to do something on climate. Because they know that if they don't, they're going to lose young people. You know, they, they're going to lose um, their base, basically, because um, people are not fools. Um, so, I mean, you know, you're a South African. You know, I was part of the Irish struggle against um, apartheid. Um, we were lucky to have Kader Asmal. I, he was my yeah. first law teacher, in fact, yeah. um, in uh, Dublin, and went back to join Mandela in his, in his government. Um, it looked impossible when we were working on this in the, um, in the 70s and 80s. Um, but, you know, it, it, it won through. And that brings me maybe to the second point. I often quote Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was the first chair um, of the elders, a man I love. And um, uh, we were together in New York at a social good conference, oh, at least 10 years ago now. And a social good conference is young people on their iPhones and their iPads, et cetera, getting a great social media buzz. That's the whole idea. And we were being moderated by an American journalist. And um, when Tutu's in front of um, young people, you know, he just expresses his love and he waves his arms and all the rest. And she said quite sharply, Archbishop Tutu, why are you such an optimist? And he looked at her and he shook his head. And he said, oh, no, dearie, I'm not an optimist. I'm a prisoner of hope. And that, for me, again, was, well, I, mean, I remember kind of being very taken by it at the time, but I've thought about it so much since. You have to be a prisoner of hope, because um, if, you're, if you're a prisoner of hope, you don't see the glass is half full, or the bottle is half full. You see there's something there that you work with. And that's the difference between speaking about climate in a way that frightens everyone, and all the energy goes out of the room, or saying it's very serious, but we can do things and everybody has a responsibility, and we can do more, et cetera. In other words, and the book that I've, um, I had a copy there for Hashim, but I forgot to give it to him, so you can wave it there, yes. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, it's 11 stories on climate justice. As it happens, nine of those stories involve women, but there are also two good men, and they're all about hope, resilience, and the fight for a sustainable future. That's the, the byline title to the, to the book. And, and they are my heroes, you know, the people who are, actually fighting back in that, in that way. And I think we do need to be prisoners of hope. Hope is absolutely vital. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Hi, uh, I'm Marguerite Nyan. I'm from University College Cork in Ireland. And I'm a visiting scientist at Harvard. Uh, so thank you very much and, for And this is your badge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's your badge now. <laughs> um, so thanks very much for your lecture today and for continuously using your intellect all throughout your life uh, for, for making the world a better place for all. Um, so as we're here at MIT, um, I just want to kind of ask you what, what your thoughts are on kind of technology and the unprecedented advances in technology that we're seeing here today or uh, in, in our world today. And as we're here as well, um, you know, how can scientists and engineers work more closely with the international, um, you know, with the 
with the um, with international organisations, how can we work mm. with um, those working on international development issues and humanitarian action worldwide? How mm. do you think we can find ways uh, to work more closely together? Mm. I think it's a really very good question. Uh, first of all, I believe that technology and innovation are vital because we still have a big hill to climb to get to uh, reducing by 45% our emissions by 2030 and then down to zero um, by uh, 2050. Uh, sucking carbon out of the air, carbon capture, all of those things. Um, at the same time, I'm, I'm apprehensive about some kind of projects for geoengineering. Um, I'm, I, it's not a word that I understand, but actually as elders, we've decided to monitor from an ethical point of view um, the kinds of proposals for big uh, engineering projects because we're already finding, even with the clean energy uh, um, industry, mistakes are being made with mega projects that uh, have no regard for the human rights, the land rights, the water rights of poor people or pastoralists or, you know, they just don't see them. And um, it's done um, in, in agreement with the head of state or whatever, um, and no regard at all for the impact on the ground. And I, I've seen quite a bit of that um, in Honduras when I was, uh, I had my mandate for El Nino and climate. Um, uh, women were complaining about uh, the fact that they had no water and how do you live without water? They were, you know, in, in extremis um, in this part of the dry corridor. Um, of Central America, and they said, but there's a big hydro pr project there, and it's also knocked down trees, and we won't see any water. It's going to the city. So, you know, uh, so uh, there are a lot of human rights abuses happening um, with mega projects that don't respect human rights. I very much fear what might happen with geoengineering unless we're very, very careful and, and make sure that it does respect human rights. And then the second question, the second part of what you were saying, I think is really important. Um, you know, Scientists, in my view, um, by and large, are not really very good communicators with people. And that you know, is a pity, because if they were better communicators, we probably would have understood the science. Yep. I mean, when I say that, I mean, it amazed me when I read the Climate Convention of 1992. There is one half phrase about people, current and future generations of humankind. I think that's about people. Thing. And we had to work very hard with the Paris Climate Agreement to get it to be people-centered with gender and human rights, which you know, it by and large is, and that's new. And you know, so th that kind of link is really important. And I think you know, the more science, I think the IPCC has got much better. I think this recent report was their best report from a communications point of view. It was stark, but it was also well communicated. Um, and I, I, you know, I hope that more and more scientists will you know, give that kind of communications leadership on what they're doing and how it can help um, to, to address our problems. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. I better give shorter answers, I think. I <laughs> okay. Well, I just wanted to take you away from people, actually, into the question of capitalist urbanization. And if we think if we live in the shadow of 2008, I'm always, and the financial crisis, and, you know, I understand that the post period is one of very much what urbanists call a spatial fix. And I'm always taken by this idea that China consumed and produced more concrete in 2008 to 2013 than the US did from 1900 to 2000. And you know that obviously has incredible environmental implications. And we've seen in the SDGs now the introduction of SDG 11 on the cities, but you know in UN forums and I don't think in the elders either. There's really talk about the challenge of urbanization, mm. and in specifically capitalist urbanization, and the kinds of um, production and consumption that you touched upon mm. briefly earlier. So, and especially, you know, as a school of uh, architectural planning and mm. questions of urbanization, you know, mm. how we can engage better yeah. with that and insert those kinds of questions. What work can we do, mm. and how you think in, in relation mm. to that question, if, if at mm. all? Again, I think that's a really good question, and I don't think I actually have the answers for the very reason that you're saying. We don't think enough about... Um, I was in China recently with the elders. I led a group of you know, Ban Ki-moon and um, uh, Ricardo Lagos, Ernesto Zedillo, and um, uh, Lacto Brahimi, and we had a meeting with President Xi and his top team, and we met, we met all the leaders there, but we particularly met him for an hour. And we talked about the Belt and Road Initiative. We talked about... We even talked about... 
you know, the need not to um, have a, an indebtedness and a lack of capacity to sustain in some of the Belt and Road Initiative. That, um, and we talked about um, uh, the fact that China is meeting its commitments, and it is meeting its commitments under the Paris Agreement. And, you know, almost could China do more because there are other countries that aren't meet, meeting their commitments. It was, a, it was an interesting um, conversation. But, um, you know, China's exporting coal technology very heavily, and it's doing lots of other things in developing countries, where it's trying to clean up China and, you know, um, have less pollution, more tree planting in China itself. So it, it, it's a huge kind of um, strange world in a way. Um, but I, I agree with you. I, I think we just need much more attention to design, to how we live together, etc. Um, uh, I'm hearing now, um, in a way that I appreciate, um, uh, African leaders talking about the need for them to have more priority on the size of population, population growth. That's something that people almost you know, shy away from. But we actually know what works educate girls and women, have a health system that works, and have access to contraceptives. But unfortunately, partly because of this very broad gag rule of the Trump administration, um, there are something like 230 million women today who want and can't get contraceptives. And they're mainly in Africa and parts of India. So, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, that's also part of you know, uh, where we need to see a change. I mean, Rwanda is a good example of a country that's working very hard on that issue. But it's beginning to be talked about now more um, as, a, as a priority. And that's also relevant to, um, to urbanization. Yeah. But thank you. I mean, some of your questions are going to be questions that I'm not equipped to answer, but you lot are. So I throw them back. But how do we get that dialogue going? It's been very difficult in the UN, for instance, to, yeah. to even, you know, the con UN Habitat is one of the smallest agencies. In the yes, it's got yeah, it is very small. That yeah. is a pittance. Yeah. UN agencies, UNDP, you know, yeah. urbanization is not a language they understand. Yeah. The elders doesn't have any aspect towards urbanization. How do we get this conversation yeah. going? Yeah. Okay, I'll tuck that one away. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Kurt Newton. I'm on staff here at MIT and spend a lot of time doing climate change work. First of all, I have to thank you so much for what you're doing with the podcast with Mothers, Out, <laughs> with Mothers of Invention. And if you haven't checked it out, by all means, everybody should. <laughs> Good, thank you. I <laughs> um, wanted to ask for you to reflect a little bit more on your second point of the three points about we need to get angry hmm. and direct it at the places that need to happen. Um, and how to, how to hold that and build that on the one hand and also carry it along with not leaving anybody behind. Mm -hmm. I feel like when, in, in so many cases around climate activism, that anger tends to make certain people who uh, we don't wish to, <laughs> to be, you know, feeling, uh, feeling it directed at them. For instance, you know, coal field workers or people yeah. who are you know, working in those environments. Yeah. How, do we, how do we do those things simultaneously? Yeah. Any thoughts? No, I, I thank you. That gives me an opportunity, and I probably should have um, referenced it earlier, because it's such an important part of climate justice. And that is we have to plan for a just transition. Um, and that means we have to both listen to and work with and fund the future of coal workers, oil, gas, the, you know, all of those who worked in the, the extraction that we can no longer have, that we have to plan and phase out of. And you know, there are countries that are really doing this quite well. Spain, for example, uh, decided to have no more um, coal, uh, to, to start closing coal plants, and they put up a lot of money. Um, Germany isn't doing enough, but it has a coal commission, and they're thinking about how to, how to do this. Um, and it, it is extremely important that we do it in such a way that we bring um, the uh, the, the workers and their communities um, with us, not just in funding and pensioning off if they've worked for 30 or 40 years in a particular industry. They've contributed to the economy. They deserve to be pensioned off. Uh, they're probably too old to learn new skills in a, a modern digital world anyway. And, um, and there should be you know, particular focus on trying to get clean energy into um, the uh, areas that are going to be um, otherwise um, losing out. Um, there's a story in the book, actually. Um, it, it, one of the men um, is a trade union leader 
who was, uh, it was actually a mining thing in Canada, but he was trying to work for a just transition. And although they tried very hard, it didn't work too well. And now he's with the Alberta car, tar sands in a better job, but he knows that he again has to plan for this just transition. So it gives a good insight into you know, how difficult it can be, but how much we have to work at it. And it's a really important part. We have to bring people with us. So thank you for that question. Thank you for being with us uh, here today. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm, I'm very supportive of the idea of this bottom-up uh, type of movement, but I'm also concerned with how targeted and strategic our top-down approaches have been, and in particular, how effective they are in battling against a logic of convenience that allows for bad behavior. And what I'm thinking of in particular is uh, the recent example of what has been happening in Mozambique, yeah. which is a country w which I've worked over the past decade. Mm. As everyone knows, a cyclone hits Mozambique, it's in the newspapers, everyone's concerned with it. I don't know how many people have heard of a second cyclone hitting in the northern part of the country mm. um, just this past weekend. Ironically, painfully ironically, um, at the same time that this is happening, the former minister of finance of Mozambique, Manuel Chang, is under investigation for essentially stealing two billion euros um, of a loan that was and I kid you not, for securing the coastline. Mm. Now, what they meant by securing the coastline was securing the energy investments in mm. the north of the country, which has been essentially mm. targeting or uh, being exploited for economic development mm. reasons. Mm. Now, the problem with this is that it's all too easy to point the finger and say, yeah. this is bad governance, this is African mm. governments behaving the way that we don't want them to be. But in fact, if you look at who was supporting the loans, it was Credit Suisse, mm. it was a Russian bank. Mm. So my question to you is, how do we clean up our own houses? <laughs> right? How do we clean up our own houses and yeah. ensure that the logic of convenience, of financial mm. convenience, mm. is not one that would allow for this kind of mm. behavior to continue? Because it's all well and good to put children and mothers, I'm mm. happy to go with my own son, mm. on the forefront. But it makes no difference unless we can push mm. down at the same time and tell players at every sector that this is not going to be acceptable anymore. Mm. Thank you. Well, again, thank you for the question. Actually, thank you for that insight into um, uh, corruption being part of the problem in relation to um, you know, strengthening the coastline in Mozambique. I've followed that very closely, partly because Grasa Michelle is a very good friend. And she went to Beira, the, 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 the main city that was devastated by the first cyclone, as you say. And she said, 300,000 people. And it, it, it's just gone. You know, it's, it's, it's flattened. And they've nowhere to go. They've no plan B. They've no insurance. They've no FEMA. <laughs> um, and um, now the uh, second cyclone, Kenneth, um, has hit. But I wasn't aware of the thing. But your, your point is a broader one. Yes, um, I belong to um, a foundation that tries to deal with African leadership and African governance, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, um, Hadil's father. And um, I've been on the um, board and the prize committee of that foundation from the beginning. And it's the real focus on, you know, um, sort of taking on issues of bad leadership and corruption, but doing it in a way that's very positive for um, African civil society, African young people, et cetera. It makes them feel um, you know, that they, they can work for their continent. And it's encouraging that sense of young Africans who want a different future. And so, um, you know, I mean, the, um, the, the sort of corruption of um, you know, capital leaving Africa is, is a scandal, um, as um, uh, President Mbeki and his commission um, exposed some years ago. And that's all part of a, part of a problem. But, whew. <laughs> yes? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe a quick thought on also um, whether some disciplines are more privileged to think about the impact on the environment than others. And I'm thinking particularly of um, the law and the idea of the stick and the carrot. And it seems Sorry, that thinking about the law, the law a, yeah. and the idea of both a planetary regulation uh, with a stick and the carrot. And some have proposed the ideas of um, rights of nature mm. uh, as an expansion of human rights. And others have explicitly called upon ecocide 
yes. as drawing upon previous precedents in which you mm. regulate any uh, merchants mm. of doubts, putting the work yeah. of scientists into doubt, or uh, withdrawals from planetary agreements um, as a way of uh, <laughs> a punishing maybe an increase in mm. carbon emission rather than always being um, uh, dissatisfied with breaching those limits. So I'm wondering what whether that resonates or could have traction, or whether such forms of mm, regulation hmm. don't stand a chance. Yeah. Uh, it, it, just, uh, I don't want to interrupt. I just want to say that uh, after these four questions, we do have to stop time-wise. Good, <laughs> because I'm running out of steam, too. <laughs> OK. Um, as a lawyer, you know, I'm interested in um, you know, what can be done. I mean, um, Macron um, has uh, championed strengthening and having maybe an environmental court even, but strengthening the environmental laws in a more coherent way. That, that's one uh, project, the Ecoside. What's her name who died recently far too young? What was her name? Pauline. Yes, Pauline, yeah. Um, you know, um, she, she really uh, made, a, made a very strong case. Um, there are more and more climate cases, climate litigation. In fact, our first podcast uh, between uh, Maeve Higgins and myself was about climate litigation. And um, there's a case in Ireland, which is awaiting judgment. There's a case, you know, um, grannies are suing Switzerland, you know, angry grannies, um, I love it. And, you know, there, 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 are, there are a very significant number of cases now around the world. And you have this Children's Trust case that's brewing up in Oregon. I don't think it's, I think the, the government, of, uh, the um, federal administration has tried very hard to, to stall it and it still hasn't got a hearing. Um, but um, so there's a lot of law and litigation going on. I actually challenged the International Bar Association a few years ago, and they took up the challenge, and they have a very good report called, um, um, I've forgotten what it's called, but it's on there. It, it, um, um, a something justice in a climate-conflicted world. What's the word? It's not accessing justice, but um, anyway. Um, uh, they've a whole lot of recommendations and they're trying to um, go forward with them. So there is a, I mean, the legal profession was very behind the curve on climate, like many professions, but I think we're catching up and the, uh, there is more litigation, et cetera. And I better give shorter answers. Yes. <laughs> we have sparked a, a range of <laughs> questions and enthusiasm here. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Azrak Shamia. I'm associate professor in the Art Culture Technology Program. I was really inspired by your three points. You're calling us to make it personal, to make it activist, and also uh, the notion of imagination. I, yeah. I was very inspired by that because I think we do, uh, we need to imagine before yes. we can make something. And beyond that imagination being personal, I think it would be important to think about institutional imagination. And mm. we here at MIT are trying to find ways in which we can you know, break out of our disciplinary silos and try to share knowledge across disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on, um, on that. How, what is the potential of transdisciplinary um, collaboration to change the culture um, that produces climate change? And also, what could be the role of art and culture in changing mm. this um, imagination mm. and, and, and that mm. culture? Because you know we yeah. are getting yeah. really used to the mantra also here in yeah. the art and design community yeah. too, that it's yeah. harder to um, imagine the end of capitalism yeah. than the end of the world. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think there are ways. Yeah. I wonder if you could reflect. Yeah. Well, all I can do is almost echo what you were saying, the importance of getting out of the silos, the importance of um, you know, learning across and sharing and influencing from different perspectives. Uh, we need all of that. And I believe that art and culture have an extraordinary role to play now in imagining this world and helping us to, uh, you know, to be the prisoners of hope who are determined to get there um, because uh, it's, it's going to be a world where, as I say, um, where actually um, we become more human um, in our relationships, in our sense of beauty, in our sense of the value of things, in our, in, in our whole way of uh, responding. And I think art and culture are absolutely vital. So um, I, can, I can only encourage you in, 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 in where you're going. And, um, and uh, you know, I'm a lawyer. I'm a mere lawyer. Uh, I, you know, so, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will start a conversation that won't be able to finish now. But in your points on getting angry and yeah. also imagining the future, 
I just want to pause and think even longer back in history and note we can trace a lot of today's injustice to the last 500 years, the patterns we've created of capitalism and of colonialism and yeah. racism. So when you, all the examples you've given of those who are most in danger uh, to climate change, those near the equator, those near the poles, indigenous communities, uh, how can we listen better to those who are the most in jeopardy due to climate change? Yeah. Uh, it's easy for us to talk about the countries that are yeah. most active, but then I guess what are your reflections on listening to the imaginings of those, especially near the equator who, where most people live, uh, yeah. who are the ones who have the biggest stake and yeah. the ones who have been traditionally um, harmed? Uh, that's a very good question. And actually, I do have a kind of ex specific experience that I can share briefly with you. Um, when, we, when I realized in particular but when, that you know, there was no reference to gender in the climate discussions you know, at Copenhagen, for example, which was my first climate conference. Um, the following COP uh, was in Cancun, and it happened that there was a platform with three women on it who had presided or were about to preside over this very male technical world that was the climate world. Um, uh, Connie Hedegaard um, had, had um, presided over Copenhagen before she went off to be climate commissioner. Um, Patricia Espinosa was the Minister for Foreign Affairs in, in, and presiding over uh, Cancun, and Mighty Mashaban was about to preside over Durban. Um, and I was on the platform with them, and we decided to form um, a Troika plus, meaning those three plus, of women leaders on gender and climate. And that became very significant in getting gender and a gender action plan. But to your point, it really became significant when we realized, well, after all, these are ministers for environment or energy. They're heads of delegations to these conferences. So they can decide who's going to be in the delegation. And when they started having in their delegation grassroots women, indigenous women, young women, it made a huge difference. I can't tell you how often I was in a room of delegates when um, uh, Constance O'Kellett, who's one of the stories in the book, would get up and speak from her experience in Uganda of the flood that destroyed her village. And it just electrified the discussion because most of these delegates have never been in the front line of climate change. And so these front line voices became and are still informing now more and more. And they're on platforms. But in the old days, they used to be out in the civil society area. And the delegates didn't even bother going there. Now they're in the room, and they're taking part, and they're criticizing, and, they're, and it, it does make a huge difference. And I'm totally committed to that idea of listening to the, the real experts. And that's what most of the stories of the book are about. It's those who are building resilience in a situation they're not responsible for the problem that has changed their lives for the worse, and they're trying to make their, their, their communities resilient. And, and, and hearing their voices in, in conferences has been extremely important. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you for your remarks, um, and I appreciate your endorsement of, of fossil fuel divestment. Um, my, my particular question is about the issue of carbon neutrality, um, and it's, it's exciting to hear about these new commitments from companies and governments committing to carbon neutrality, um, but that there is a, a difference between being carbon neutral and actually being carbon free, and that it's yeah. much more difficult to be carbon free. So mm. I can build enough solar panels to offset the energy use of my house, but if I actually want to be completely independent of fossil fuels, that's a much harder problem. Hmm. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the prospects of having cities or states or, or countries um, make commitments to actually demonstrate uh, carbon-free economies on a much uh, faster timeline, because we, we know that's where we need to head in the long term, but there are significant challenges to work through on the way there. We don't want to get to 2050 and realize there's um, more challenges that we need to figure out how to tackle. And so just curious about um, yeah. the prospects on actually reaching that carbon-free target yeah. for you know, certain smaller constrained areas, yeah. but on a faster timeline. Yeah. No, I do agree. I mean, there is, as you say, um, a difference, and we need to be as carbon-free as possible and not um, fudge and you know, do offsets or you know, um, uh, uh, you know, not, in fact, um, uh, reach where we need to be. Um, uh, I have to say, um, it, you know, it is a big challenge um, to have a carbon-free world um, by 2050. Um, uh, you know, that, that would, would take um, a revolutionary approach. Um, I think we're beginning to think in those terms, um, but uh, uh, it, it would be difficult, um, I think. I, I mean, in other words, um, I think there are going to be fudges a little bit along the line um, of, um, you know, 
on, on the carbon neutral rather than carbon free side. But um, as far as I'm concerned, um, what is really important is that we get um, a recognition that those two frameworks um, of 2015 are what have, ha has been agreed by, um, in, in, in the case of the 2030 agenda, 193 countries, in the case of the um, uh, Paris Agreement, 195 countries, and even uh, President Trump uh, in saying he will pull the United States out, he can't do it until the 4th of November 2020. And you remember when your next presidential election is, I hope. And, you know, who knows? But um, even if he does, it's still 194 countries. Um, and um, nobody else, uh, well, Brazil, yes, maybe under its current president, has um, uh, waved a bit on, on, but has not expressly said that he would pull out of the Paris Agreement. But um, I, I really think we need to get the political will going now to um, build on um, a movement that has many parts to it and that can, and, and, and actually, I mean, I, I mentioned women leaders, youth, universities, philanthropy, um, business um, that is non-fossil fuel and is committed. I think um, there's also, um, you know, the investment community. Um, the um, governor of the central bank and, um, in London and, and, and in Paris and other central bank governors issued a very strong warning um, just the other day about the risks of being invested in carbon. And you know, that's, again, what, what's helping to shift thinking. And this idea now um, of climate emergencies, uh, Scotland is proclaiming a, a climate emergency. And as I mentioned, Jeremy Corbyn is thinking about it. Um, these are things we hadn't heard until recently. So I think we're on the right way. And, and the more we can be really carbon free, I agree with you, the better. But let's at least move and move quickly on it. Um, because we don't have much time. And um, uh, I am an angry granny. I have these um, uh, six grandchildren. They range in age from 15 um, to one. And um, you know, they'll be in their 20s and 30s in 2050. You know, more than half their life to lead. They'll share the world with 9.5 billion is the kind of estimate we're getting. Could be a bit more, could be a bit less, but it'll be certainly over the nine billion. Um, what kind of world? What kind of future? So um, I think you know, th this really is a, um, a, an extraordinary time. Uh, for those of you who are students, it's an extraordinary time to be a student and be thinking and be contributing to that better future that we need to, to get to. So all the best in it. And um, thank you for those great questions. OK. <laughs> That's questions.